Hi, Vanessa. Good morning. Or I guess it's actually where you are. (laughs) Yes, it's two o'clock here. So I've had my lunch. I've had my coffee. Quite happy. We are going to talk about off-camera flash today. So thank you for all of you who are, you know, who's joining and who wants to tackle this fun topic. At least now I think it's fun. And I hope by the end of this webinar, you will think flash is fun too. If you don't know anything about me, uh, we'll get into little bits about that. It's not super interesting, but I think it's helpful to know, you know, who I am and what I do. So again, my name is Vanessa Joy and I'm a photographer in the New York and New Jersey area. I photograph weddings and portraits and roughly about 20 weddings a year. I try not to do more than that. And then the portrait sessions are sprinkled in there. I'm both a Canon Explorer of Light as well as a Pro Photo Legend of Light. So I think those things do qualify me to teach you a little bit of light. Uh, and I am a mom, so I am a working mom. And um, here in Jersey, try to figure out all the things, how to cook and how to run a business. But we are going to talk about off-camera flash. And if you've ever seen any of my work, it usually looks like this photo of me here. In fact, I took this photo myself. And I like a lot of color. I like a lot of detail. And I like a soft, natural light look. And a lot of people think that, well, you don't get that when you have flash. But what I want to show you today, which is a little portion of what I've included in my book, the off-camera flash handbook, is about a quick way to do that, and we're going to have a lot of fun with it. So let's just go over the gear first, what I use for gear. Um, This is kind of in the order in which I use it the most. So I have my backup is my 1DX Mark II, and I'm currently shooting with the Canon 1DX Mark III. I also shoot with an EOS R. I love prime lenses, shoot with a ton of them. Uh, I do have some zoom lenses that I like, particularly for the R, the 20, the 70. And lens choice actually does matter for what I'm gonna show you about the off-camera flash tricks I'm gonna show you today. So keep that in mind, we'll get to that later. As far as what lights I use, I'm using primarily Profoto gear. So the Profoto A1, B10 and C1 I recently started experimenting with. Believe it or not, that little very controversial light, (laughs) that C1 light, which is seemingly very expensive for a small light, has some pretty unique uses. But whatever we talk about, I'm showing you my gear because I get that question, but the concepts that we're going to talk about throughout this presentation have nothing to do with gear. Yes, they'll have to do with focal length. Yes, you will need a flash in order to shoot flash, but it doesn't matter if you're using a Godox or Allen Chrome or Bronco or anything. It doesn't matter. The concepts are all the same. You obviously are just going to use your equipment slightly differently. So let's flip to the next. Natural light is pretty. I'd love to hear in the chat actually, and I get very distracted by the chat. So please distract me. How many of you consider yourselves natural light photographers, or at least at one time considered yourself a natural light photographer? I know I considered myself that for a very long time. Wasn't it excuse because I didn't know how to use flash? Well, kind of, yes. But also I thought that using flash would change that brand image. My pictures would go from soft and light and airy and beautiful and whimsical to, you know, you know, harsh or surreal or larger than life. But lighting, when you're using it, can be anything that you want it to be. You can make it your brand. If your brand is, you know, dark and moody and all you do all day is run around and you're just searching for that beam of light that you can put a subject in while everything else goes dark, well, use flash and now you don't have to search for any beam of light. Same thing with natural light photographers who just want to shoot during golden hour. Well, you don't have to only shoot during golden hour and look for the sun peeking through the clouds right above the horizon. Now you can bring the sun, which is something that I tell my clients very often. Uh, By the way, this is not natural light, this photograph, Uh, neither is anything else that you will see in this slideshow. So everything here is shot with flash. Now, a lot of people get scared of off-camera flash, thinking it's too much to learn, the equipment's too heavy, there's way too much equipment, I don't want to bring anything else. Thankfully, a lot of those problems are solved. My biggest problem with flash, and this is me telling you a story, it's too easy to look like an idiot. 
when you use flash. In fact, it's the only thing that you can do as a photographer where your client knows right away that you are totally screwing up because you set up a flash. I once had a wedding and it was one of the first times I was using off camera flash because the photographer that I was working for insisted that I use it during the flat, uh, during the formals at the ceremony pictures of the family on the church. And he was right. I needed a flash. So we set up the off camera flash, tested the photo, uh, me and the other photographer that I was working with, tests fine, fire is fine. The second we pose everybody, all 40 people, because we decided to do the group shot first, and in their spots, look at me, one, two, three, fire, click, and the flash shows and go off. And six of those 40 people, your flash doesn't fire. Flash is the only thing that you can do right away that you're, you know, other than leaving your lens cap on, but usually we can figure that one out. Um, so it can be a complete nightmare, but thankfully it's not really a nightmare anymore. Now, you know, it's much easier to learn. The equipment is so much easier to use and there's a much shorter learning curve, a much faster learning curve. Plus it differentiates you from all the other natural light photographers. Everyone shoots natural light, everyone. Even people that say that they're flash photographer only unless they're in the studio 100% of the time and always have a flash on, they are potentially using some ambient light. So for you to be able to grab a flash and create some magic when it's pouring rain outside, that's gonna separate you. That's gonna mean something to your clients and you know, being able to trust you to take photographs no matter what the weather conditions are or lighting conditions. One of my favorite things about off-camera flash is the ability to annoy Uncle Bob, as I say. So if you are a wedding photographer, you probably know who this person is. If you're not, then I'll educate you. And Uncle Bob is somebody that is at the wedding, usually with an iPhone or an iPad, and he's constantly in your way, taking photos, stepping into the aisle as a bride walks down it. All, you know, all the nightmare stories and memes that you see on Instagram and Facebook. That's Uncle Bob. Well, my favorite thing to do with Uncle Bob, if he's particularly following me during the photo session, is I will put the bride and groom in just heinous looking light, very unattractive, something that is not going to look good when he photographs it with whatever equipment he has. And I have my light set up and I am just creating magic there. It's the fastest way to be like, yep, don't worry, Bob, I got this. As some people say, uh, Uncle Bob or Aunt Sally. The other nice thing is you have a crazy amount of control. So it can be raining outside and you can make it look like a sunny day. It can be nighttime and you can make it look like sun is pouring through a window. You have a lot of control that so many photographers just can't guarantee their clients. But if you learn flash, you can. The nice thing and the bottom line part is that you end up selling more stuff. So this photo here, you've got beautiful bride, gorgeous location. That moon is real. That moon is not added in Photoshop. Will she be satisfied with this epic shot only being a little four by six picture in her album? Not in a million years. This picture is going to end up at the very least taking up a whole spread in an album or probably, you know, hung up on the wall like some of my photos behind me. So you'll end up selling more when you're using flash and you create these grand masterpieces and you create more imagery that you can then put into albums. And quite frankly, it's just not hard anymore. So the first thing I want to do before we actually get into the instruction, I want to give you a little freebie. I am not going to talk so much about the posing aspect. And I know I get a lot of questions on that. So I'm just giving you a free posing guys guide to download. I do believe it's going to be in that replay email, this link, but you can just go to breatheyourpassion.com forward slash poses, and then you'll be able to grab this posing guide. All right, let's get into this. We're going to get into off camera flash tips. This is a really good example. This was a winter wedding in March and it was raining and I was able to give her sunny day pictures. So the difference is you get to create the light, not just have to adapt around the light. Now, the first thing that I want you to think about is a flash. I know when I first started learning about flash, I thought whatever was coming out of the speed light or the strobe was somehow defying the laws of physics. But whatever is coming out of that flash 
follows all the same rules of light and things that you already know. You already know a lot about flash. Uh, it's the same type of behavior like light travels in straight lines and light reflects off of surfaces at an equal angle. Um, so it's like physics, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Light does the same thing, meaning you could use a flash and then flash it right into a reflector, pretending like it's, you know, you're just reflecting the sun. It does the same exact thing. The difference is that you make the sun. Uh, these photos right here were taken, uh, it wasn't after sunset, it was just before, but it was in the middle of New York City with skyscrapers all around us and we were in the middle of a courtyard. It was right outside, right in Midtown, right outside Broadway, uh, and we just had one flash behind them and a reflector in front. So not only was the light coming from behind them, my flash coming from behind them to give that warm glow, but it was then just reflecting right back in their faces to light their faces. It wasn't pitch black, so there is ambient light happening here, but just to illustrate the fact that it's just like the sun. It's just like light. It behaves the exact same way. Now my goal when it comes to photography in general is to make it look natural, but I do want it to pop. I like that pop. I like color. I like brightness and vibrance. This photo right here is from Central Park. Uh, in my opinion, Central Park is where light goes to die <laughs> everywhere. Just light is sucked away. Um, so this is a typical bridge. Every photographer photographs here, everyone. Uh, this is a natural light shot and uh, you know, no off camera flash at all. And this is the photo that every single person takes right here. This is right before you get to the carousel in the middle of Central Park, super popular place. That's what everyone else's photo looks like. But this is what my photo looks like. Just a little bit of off camera flash brings it to life. Now when these couples are looking for a photographer and they're going through every Central Park picture and they see this bridge and it is somewhat recognizable, what photo do you think is gonna jump out to them more? This one or one that looks like that? Especially when all the other ones look like this. They're gonna jump out and pop out to this one. Now, let's get to the beginning of our photographic education and part of Flash. Where do you think, in the chat, I want you to tell me I'm gonna pull up my chat. Where do you think that the light is here in this picture? Uh, I will give you a little bit of a hint. I'm going to pull up my chat here. Where do you think the light is in this picture? Oh, hey, Alan. Oh, look at all these people here. So nice. Inside the tunnel. Perfect, Chris. So you think the light is inside the tunnel. How can you tell that it's inside the tunnel? Well, there's a light ring around the tunnel. So it has to at least be that far back. Uh, and it's pointed towards the couple and right behind the couple, Danielle, perfect. Uh, and it's not on the ground, though you could have done this with the ground. I do have an assistant standing behind them. So that is a perfect point, Peter. You could put it inside on the ground. So it's on the back, it's pointed at them. You could tell because their bodies are outlined in light, rim light, uh, same thing with the tunnel. Now, what color is the light? I put a gel on here. What color gel did I put on here? This is not a trick question, not yet. I have trick questions about gels later. Um, those are fun. We can get into a lot of fun stuff. But what color gel do you think I put on the flash? C oh, look at you guys, they're all smart, CTO. You guys say the smart words. Half CTO. Um, warm tungsten. No one's just saying the obvious word. It's orange, right? <laughs> Double CTO. So this is actually a full CTO gel uh, and not a fancy one. I'm pretty sure it's one that like I cut out of something and put a rubber band around my flash. It was nothing that I spent more than six and a half cents on. So I used to get gels and just like cut them out and rubber band them around my flash. So that's exactly what this is. When you were first starting to learn flash, the one thing that you want to do and we go through this in the book is you want to learn to deconstruct images. You want to learn to look at images and figure out what the heck is happening here. Uh, that will help you so much because then you just reverse engineer it when you're going to shoot for yourself. Uh, Olivia says you love CTO gel. Oh my gosh, do I ever. But why? Because it's mimicking the warm glow of the sun. And that's what I tell my clients all the time. You don't worry if it rains on your wedding day, I bring the sun. So it's a nice guarantee that I can give them at any time. Uh, this also has CTO gel in it. 
Um, when it comes to off-camera flash, for me, for the most part, the light is the accent. And making the light the accent is the key to making it look natural because you're technically still shooting with all the ambient light outside or in the room. You're just adding your off-camera flash as an accent. Now in the book, we go over a heck of a lot more than just light being the accent, but that is how I primarily use, um, use light in general. So remember how I said that it was makes a big difference with lens choice. So when you go try this trick, and I'm going to give you a lighting diagram in a little bit, and I'll, how I get my settings and things like that. But when you go to try this trick, and you want to make that nice warm glow behind them, like these pictures here, same exact concept, by the way, CTO gel, because I'm pretty sure I put two on here to get more of an orange look, and it was off to the camera right versus right behind them, because you can see the glow is more bright to the right. Um, so for this, the 50 millimeter lens, it doesn't quite have the same effect because of compression and the way that longer lenses let light sort of haze in. The 135 and all the way down at 2.0, I believe I did take this photo, that low aperture and combination of a long focal length is going to help the light look a little bit more soft, a little bit more like a haze coming in versus something that's um, more direct that makes sense. So if you want to do that warm glow behind them, that's what you're looking for. A nice long lens and a little bit lower of an aperture. You could have, by the way, shot this at five, six and you still, you know, a medium size aperture and you still would have gotten that haze. It's more from the long focal length than anything else. Uh, Danielle asked, did you, am I allowed to read questions? Cause I get very distracted. Uh, I'll read this one, Danielle asked. Uh, did you move the light closer to the couple in the 135 millimeter shot? No. Nope, I didn't move, they didn't move almost at all, except for him grabbing her face. There was nothing that happened except I changed my lens and I'm pretty sure the settings didn't even change. So that is the biggest difference, but it seems like I moved closer because of the perspective of compression that the lens has. So very, very effective trick. Um, I do have a lot about lenses and things like that on my YouTube channel. So if you are not on my YouTube channel, haven't found it yet, it's just youtube.com forward slash Vanessa Joy. And I actually have videos on both of those lenses. And I talk about the different things and you know, why one does certain things. I have a lot actually just in general on flash on my YouTube channel. So definitely a good place to go. All right. So if you want to start setting up your camera with off camera flash. Let's just say you want to try really any trick. It doesn't even have to be this trick. This is my basic setup for how I shoot off camera flash and how I get my exposure. First thing I do, I get my exposure as if I was just shooting, you know, that couple back there without any flash at all. As if I was just shooting natural light, just like that natural light of the couple in front of the tunnel at Central Park. You can do that however you want. You can use your light meter in your camera, you can, you know, shoot in program, you can shoot in manual, you can do whatever you want. Personally, I like to flip to live view, which has actually extra functions on my 1DX Mark III. And then I mess around with my exposure to like get what I want. And it looks okay on the back screen. Now the back screen isn't foolproof, so I do take a picture and check the histogram. But get your exposure as if you're just taking a natural light photo. Then you wanna turn on your off-camera flash. I like to set it to TTL first. Most flashes have pretty good TTL functionality in them and pairing with whatever camera that you have. If you don't have a flash that has TTL, TTL is just auto for your lens. That's all it is. TTL means through the lens. It's just the light is going to figure out what needs to, how much power, how much brightness is coming out of that light in order to affect the image correctly. And one of the really cool things, uh, I believe it's in the, yeah, it's in the 1DX Mark III. There's actually now TTL modes. So TTL is a combination between the camera tech and the light tech, but in the Canon 1DX Mark III, it has two different TTL modes. It has ambient light priority and flash priority. Very fun, if you have that, I like switching it to ambient light priority. All right, um, but you're turning on your light, you're setting it to TTL and you just let it determine. Take another picture, see what it does. If you think it's too bright or you think it's too dark, you can change that. Now what I do 
is from there, I go on my light and I switch my light from that TTL to manual because I'm really just using that first flash of TTL almost like a, instead of a light meter because you could use a light meter instead. I just don't. It's not usually in my workflow in the studio sometimes. But you're going to turn it from TTL to manual and in a lot of lights, including my pro photo lights, I believe some of the Westcott lights have this function, maybe some of the flashpoint ones, but when you switch the light from TTL to manual, it locks in that power setting and that is golden because then the power setting stays the same, basically the auto that it determined. And all you have to do is tell it whether you want it to be brighter or you want it to be darker. Really with flash, there's only one control. You can make flash brighter, or you can make it darker. Yes, you can zoom and put modifiers and things like that, but ultimately that's what it is. Power goes up or power goes down. So you futz with it, make it brighter, take another shot and adjust as necessary. So really it's, I promise that was a long explanation because I just wanted to get through all of it, but screenshot this right here. When you go to use off camera flash, try this technique and of course meld it to however it is you're used to photographing. And it, it will seem less like uh, weird science over the long run. Uh, I do like using TTL, like I mentioned, instead of a light meter, particularly because I shoot a lot of weddings and I don't have time always to run out and run over to my subject, get a light meter reading and run back. This right here is a perfect example of that. Uh, if you know anything about weddings, I'm curious while I give you this story, how many wedding photographers do we have here in this, in this meeting, in this chat? Um, you know that maitre d's are sometimes nice, sometimes not. Um, they're usually not too interested in your photography. So my couple and I spoke before the wedding and I knew they were going to do a nighttime photo. They wanted one about five minutes before I was going to walk outside and set up my lights. I went up to Christina and Paul and said, hey, do you guys want to do that nighttime shot now? You know, speeches are over. Nothing's happening until cake cutting. You know, just run in, run out. It'll be super fast. It'll only be five minutes. Yeah, we want to do it. We want to do it. Great. Fantastic. I go outside, start to set up my lights, and the maitre d' follows us out and says, no, 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 they don't want to do that. A song they like just came on. They don't want to do, they don't want to do this. And in my head, I'm like, do they not want me to do this? Or do you not want me to do this? He said, nope, they didn't want to, so fine. I pack up all my stuff and I did have an assistant with me. She's carrying a light and I'm carrying a light. I start walking up the stairs and out walks the bride and groom. And I'm like, oh, wonderful. They wanted to do their night photo after I completely didn't set up and wasn't ready for them. So I had a setting, I had an exposure setting in my camera ready for the nighttime shot for just the night scene. I threw one light behind the couple. My assistant was just holding the other one, lighting their faces. I took one shot, that first one was on TTL. And then my next shot, I'd switched it to manual and lowered the light power just slightly. And then that last shot, I lowered my shutter speed so that my ambient light would pop in a little bit more in the background it would get brighter and grab that last shot before the taxi cab behind them decided to uh, run them over. Of course, <laughs> he actually did end up pulling over to the side because he was very nice. But the amount of time that I had to take those photos was nine seconds. I went and looked back at the metadata later, nine seconds from that first photo to that last one. And those are the only ones that we took there. And of course that last one that they have after I edited the, um, light stand behind them ended up being the last page of their wedding album and a beautiful print and and all of that so TTL for me is more functional because if I only had nine seconds I would have wasted it running back and forth with the light meter so that's why I I go there um, but obviously if you use a light meter also a good choice and probably a little bit more accurate so I mentioned that in the last photo, I decided to lower the shutter speed to get the background of the photo to be a little bit brighter. So getting your exposure is pretty much the same, like I mentioned before, when you're using flash as opposed to just shooting natural light, the same at least thought process goes through your head as far as you know what aperture you want to choose and things like that. But if you want to change the photo Afterwards, I want you to know what affects what because it's a little bit different than just shooting with ambient light. So the first thing is 
If you want more or less natural light, so the ambient light, the background, what's not being hit by the flash, then you change your shutter speed. Your shutter speed is the only thing that you can change that won't affect how the flash and how bright it is or dark it is on your image. So if you want the background or ambient light to be brighter or darker, you just change your shutter speed and you don't have to worry about whatever's flash is hitting your subject, the light hitting your subject is gonna change. Now, there is just a little caveat to that. If I go back to that last picture, you'll say, well, that's nice, Vanessa, but that last picture, you know, she, it looks like you added a fill light on her, or on both of them, really. And I did warm up the photo a little bit as well. But what is actually happening there? I let in more ambient light to brighten up the background, but some of those street lights were still hitting my couple. So no, it didn't change the power of the flash that was on them, but it did let in a little bit more of the light that was uh, hitting the couple, the ambient light that was hitting the couple. Seems confusing, I promise you'll get the hang of it. If you want the entire image, including how bright the flash looks, you want that all to change, you can either change your aperture or your ISO. Both the aperture and the ISO will affect the entire picture, all of the light in the picture, including the flash. So a little bit different, but not a ton. All right, let's get to the light shapers, so light modifiers, things that you can do to your flash to make it even better or to customize it in a way. I know when I first started learning flash, I would look at all these big fluffy things. That's what it would call them. Oh, they're fluffies, you know, big soft boxes, big light modifiers. I didn't know why they were round or why they were straight or why they were big or why they were small. But here's the easiest way. There's really an infinite number of light modifiers. Every company comes out with different ones, but here's how you can think about it. Just think windows. Any time that you see a light modifier on a, on a flash, on a strobe, just think to yourself, oh, it's a window. So if you see a really big window, what type of light do you get from a really big window? You get a nice soft light actually from what's hitting you right now. This is not natural light. I have, I guess that's a four by four box uh, and the light coming through. It's actually just the diffuser because it's not attached to the video light, but it's a nice big light. You think of a big window. You want to put someone by a big window, you get nice, soft, beautiful light. What happens if you have a really small window? You get very directed, hard light is what it would be called. So it's the same exact thing. Just keep your mentality of these light modifiers. Light modifiers, they're kind of just like windows. In fact, this one right here, it looks like she is next to a window and holding a window curtain. No, she is actually hugging my two by three softbox. So you can make it look very, very much uh, like natural light when you want to. Now, I know I said just now that the bigger the light modifier, that means you get nice soft light. And that's true, but it's bigger in relation to your subject. All right, here's what I mean. Uh, the sun. The sun is very, very large. Yes, we can all agree. It's, it's very large, but it's really, really far away. It's so far away that in relation to us here on earth, it's technically really small. We can do one of these jammies and just like cover it with our thumb, right? So technically the sun in relation to us is a hard light source. It is a small light source because it's very far away. However, if I were to fly myself in all these new NASA space talks and take myself right next to the sun, it would be huge. And believe it or not, even though it's super bright, that has nothing to do with it. It would be a big light source because I would be standing next to it and be bigger than me versus me being able to do one of these and cover it with my thumb. So me standing next to it would cast a beautiful, beautiful, soft, wonderful Instagram worthy light course right before it burned me to a crisp so that's what I mean when I say big light source it is a big light source in relation to your subject so I can have a really big two by three softbox or three by four softbox three feet by four feet and if it's close to me it is a big soft light but if it's far 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 away from me the farther away it goes the smaller the light source and the harder the light is the harder shadows it will create think of the sun 
hard light source, when it's directly shining down, you see very distinct shadows with a hard outline, all right? As opposed to when it's soft light, you're standing next to a really big window that the sun is not directly shining into. The shadows that fall on the ground, uh, you don't see the outline. They're nice and soft, all right? So that is closer equals bigger, bigger equals softer. All right, grids. Grids are one of my favorite things. Grids help you control your light. They help you direct it and point it. The little honeycomb things, I actually have pictures of this in the book. I go over, by the way, all these light modifiers. Uh, and thankfully, uh, I have photos of a whole bunch of different ones. I tell you what exactly they are. I talk about why you would want a soft box versus an octobox and all these different things. So that's all in there. But grids are these kind of honeycomb things that just direct the light a little bit more so you don't get light spill on the ground, which uh, can be pretty distracting if you have light spilling on the ground when you really just meant to rim light them instead. So grids can be really helpful in controlling your light. Gels, gels are the fun part. Gels are where you just get to play. You change the color of your light source. So yes, you can do something like this. She looks like she's sitting in a beautiful field and the sun is glowing behind her uh, when really she was sitting next to this graffiti window and um, some homeless guy was yelling at her behind her. That was the reality. But with gels, you, you can transform it. You can just make your environment be whatever you want it to be. So that's where you see me constantly doing this thing where I create golden hour. I create that even in the daytime, even if you're not going to make it where it's, you know, trying to mimic the sun, even if you just kind of, you know, hit the back of the head or the hair, light up the hair, it's a nice hair light, nice warm hair light. It separates them from the background, adds texture to their hair. So it's a really great technique. This is the lighting diagram that I promised you I would have. Um, so your lighting positions, it could be directly behind them, like we had with the tunnel and the couple in Central Park, and it's directly behind them, and it does that rim light effect. Or you put it just over to the side, slightly out of camera, and that's what all of these are. Uh, actually, the one all the way on the right, that's right behind them. But the other two, they're both on camera left so you just have them off to one side it really just depends on the look that you're going for i mean think of the sun when the sun is low in the sky sometimes you shoot right into it right sometimes you do that that's okay uh, sometimes you turn a little bit and you have it just kind of coming across and as it come across comes across it creates a beautiful haze a beautiful glow so those are your options um oops you can also use it to complement the light instead. So for this photo right here, I have the sun on camera right and it's hitting the back of her head. So what did I wanna do? I wanted to create something that looks a little bit larger than life, a little bit different. So I lit her face while allowing the sun to hit the back of her head. Now I have basically a two point light on her right here, which I absolutely love this picture of her. Uh, it complements the light. It doesn't necessarily hide it or change it. It's just adding to it. In fact, this photo right here, you know, maybe I could have had a reflector on her. That's a potential way to look at this one as well. Almost mimicking what you would do if the sun was behind her and you were in front of her, you know, with a reflector throwing some light on her. So this lighting setup looks like this one. Uh, yes, this is a stick figure. To be very honest, uh, in the book, there are a lot of stick figures that I have drawn for you. Uh, I do have quite a number of behind the scenes photos and actually took really throughout the years behind the scenes photos of actual jobs. But uh, some of them, I just didn't have those behind the scene photos. So uh, I drew you stick figures because there's a reason I hold a camera and not a paintbrush. So uh, now, you know, I am certainly no Bob Ross, but, um, with this one right here, I know this picture has a flashlight pointed directly at her, but you don't actually have to point it directly at them. You could sort of point it a little bit in front of them and then have the light go by, almost like it's just grazing across them, you know, grazing across, kind of kissing the light, if you will, a little bit in front. So the other thing that you can do with gels, I know we kind of deviated a little bit, in addition to how you probably see me use it all the time, where I have that warm glow coming in the back, you can actually use it to change your background, which is a lot of fun. 
a lot of fun um, because this is where the light trickery, the, the trick question I promised to ask you comes into play. So the picture on the left, that's natural light there in silhouette. Um, the sky is somewhat blue. That's just, you know, whatever white balance I was at, it's more blue. I was probably just shooting daylight balance, maybe, maybe a little bit warmer. But I knew I wanted to create this look where it was a really fiery sky, right? So what do you do if you want to just warm it all up, right? You raise your white balance. But as you raise your white balance, what starts happening to your subject's skin tones? They become Oompa Loompa orange, or as I like to call it, a uh, Jersey tan. <laughs> that magical little combination of fake baking and spray tan that for some reason only New Jersey knows how to do best. But we don't want that. So what do we have to do? We have to light their face, and I wanted to light them anyway because I wanted to see them versus it being a silhouette. And in order to cancel out the orange on their face, I had to flash them with the opposite color gel on my light. So let's back up for a second. If you're familiar with a color wheel, right? You've got colors on one side and colors on the other. So if you go to orange yellow on this side, the color that's on the opposite side, the complementary color is blue. And when you combine those two colors, they cancel each other out and make white. Very fun trick. You can do this with flashlights, by the way. Have like a, an orange flashlight and a blue flashlight. And when you have them separate, they're those colors. So when you put them together, they'll cancel each other out and go white. Anyway, so that's what's happening here. So what color gel did I put on them to cancel out the orange that I had added in to create that fiery sky? I had to use a blue gel or color temperature blue or CTB. If you ever see CTB and CTO, it's color temperature blue, color temperature orange, or blue and orange, whatever you want. All right, so it's really, really fun. I have another, let me switch to my next slide. This is another example of that, uh, but you can see it as I build. This is actually in the book step-by-step. -step. I have all my settings in there, uh, you know, all of the exact things that I use in the light modifiers. I think you can have a drone shot of this setup for you there so you can really see the behind the scenes. Um, so the first picture right there, that's just natural light. And it was very dark because I knew I wanted to show the clouds in the sky. And if I had exposed for her face, what would have happened to my sky? It would have gone white. So it's pretty dark. I wanted to, I knew in the end, I wanted to warm everything up and I wanted the whole picture to have a warmth to it, especially because she has red hair. It's only going to add to, to the photo. So I knew that to counter that, I would put a blue gel on. So that second photo is just the same exact photo as the first, except now I have a flash with a blue gel. And then the last step I did, I warmed everything up to whatever you know, color temperature I was at. I don't remember it offhand, but it is in the book. Uh, so that it, it matched and her hair looked good. And then that background, look at the difference in the background there. On the two pictures on the left, it's kind of just like, eh, all right. But on the right, that last picture, uh, it has a warmth to it. It just completely, completely transforms. So it's a lot of fun being able to do that. Like I mentioned in my book, there are a ton of different examples, well, 32 <laughs> different, different scenarios, but sometimes there's multiple examples on each so you can see how it is practically used. Um, there's everything there from portrait shoots and obviously weddings and couple shoots, lighting indoor receptions when it's dark and you can't bounce flash and things like that. Uh, so there are a lot in there. And then of course the 40% off with the Joy 40 that you can grab. So I think I just, through a ton of information at you. Please tell me in the chat if it was helpful. Uh, it must be because I haven't seen people drop off. So I know it can be like drinking through a fire hose, uh, but that's okay because I think sometimes doing that just motivates us and we get to do new fun things. Uh, and I'll be happy to go through uh, and answer any Q and A that you guys have here. This picture, by the way, while you populate and type in any questions that you have, now's a good time to do that. Uh, even if you asked them before, if you could put them in again, I'll likely see them better. Um, now go ahead and do that in the chat. But 
while you're doing that, this photo right here, I have this example in the book as well. This is such a fun combination of photos uh, or lighting techniques, techniques rather. Uh, it's a combination of this technique that I call flasher cells. It's also uh, having some fill light in there that we talk about. It's a low shutter speed. Uh, it's also controlling the atmosphere because this was shot at about two o'clock in the afternoon, but it looks like it was nighttime. So there's a lot of stuff that, that's in this picture. It's one of my absolute, absolute favorites. Cool, all right, let me, uh, if, if Mercedes is here, uh, I don't know if you were keeping track of questions or not. You guys are very chatty. So going through all this might take me a second. I'm still here. I haven't seen questions, uh, many questions come in while you were talking. It seemed most people were um, riveted <laughs> and in, <laughs> Good. interested in your presentation. But there are a couple that have come through. Um, someone's asking if you can show the slide with the graphic that shows the flash pos position again. Sure. Go back to there. Uh, and by that one, I assume you mean the one that's complementing the sun? Well, I'll just show you both and then you can tell me. So the creating golden hour one, that's the lighting position options. And then the complementing the light or complementing the sun, there's your light positions with my awesome stick figures. <laughs> And uh, Peter asked, what are your favorite modifiers? Oh, that's a good question. So gels are probably my favorite modifiers and they're the fun ones because they're actually very inexpensive. You can go to Adorama and get like a huge gel pack for all of $20. Uh, so they're probably my favorite. My second favorite, mm, oh man. You know, it's always hard to differentiate between your favorites and then the ones you use the most. So the portable beauty dish, uh, Profoto makes a portable beauty dish. So it's just smaller. It's not a hard beauty dish so I can carry it with me anywhere I go. I find that extremely useful because I can get nice and close to one of my uh, subjects and make it be a nice soft light or I can be a little bit farther away and have it be somewhat more directional. So those are probably my favorites, gels and uh, that portable beauty dish. And where, uh, why don't you just plug where you are on social media so everyone knows where to find you? Yeah, uh, the best places to find me first on Instagram. Uh, that's just at Vanessa Joy on Instagram. And it's good to follow me there and then look at my photos. I will tell you if they're flash or not. You'll be very surprised at how many are flash. And then I am new on TikTok, so you can find me on TikTok, Vanessa Joy Photo. I just hit 100 subscribers today, so pretty happy about that. Uh, but if you want actual education and not just where I am, then my YouTube channel, which is just youtube.com forward slash Vanessa Joy. There's a ton of content. I actually just released um, a video showing a little bit about the technique that was used to create uh, this photo, that one. So yeah, those are the best spots. And Garrett has asked, uh, you set up using TTL, but do you power up or down when on manual? So sometimes I switch to manual primarily just to lock in that light power, uh, because if I keep, leave it on TTL, then it's gonna fluctuate based on whatever's in front of my camera. So I could be photographing, you know, the black tuxedo and all the groomsmen who are in dark colors and it's going to think just like your camera does in auto oh i have to brighten up this photograph and it's going to splash more light power in there and then i'll put all the brides maids in there who are wearing light pink dresses and they'll think oh my gosh it's so bright in here let me darken it down and the flash won't be so powerful so i like switching it to manual just so it stays static and then if i need to go up or down on the flash power i will but that always depends sometimes Actually, fairly often, I don't need to change it at all. Great. Uh, so we don't have any more questions coming in. I'll kind of give it a minute and see if, if anything comes up. I do up. see one in the questions. It said, uh, our reef said, my picture's in a room with a heavy orange wood accents, even with a flash, come out dark. So I have to know what kind of flash you're using, how you're using it, but in the book, I specifically have lighting a dark room 
with all those settings on there. In a nutshell, you have to make sure you're not bouncing your flash. You can't do that because not only will it not bounce as effectively, but it will take on the color of whatever you're bouncing it off of. So if it's a dark orange room, then your light is going to be dark and orange. So you need to be able to point the light at your subject so it's not getting diluted by the rest of the room. And then also uh, have a high enough High enough ISO, low enough aperture, low enough shutter to bring in as much ambient light as you can. Great. Uh, why don't you just take a minute and tell everyone about what else they can find in your book? Yeah. So the book really, you know, I don't have it with me in front of me. It's been such a labor of love because I really have gone through everything that either I had trouble with or things that I use frequently, but I go over my favorite ways to even work with light modifiers that are inexpensive. One of my favorite chapters in there is, um, but light doesn't do that, it's called, <laughs> because about two years ago, I was talking with a friend of mine, I tell the story in the book, and I, I was looking at someone else's Instagram, a fellow photographer, and I was frustrated with myself and I was voicing it to my friend, Seth Miranda, who is an Adorama TV host and he's um, a fellow speaker and really, really great with light. And I'm lamenting over, you know, how much I suck as a photographer because, you know, that's what we do sometimes. We look at other people's work and just assume we're horrible. And I was like, I don't know why I can't light like this. I don't understand why my skin tones don't look, look like this or why this, why that. And he looks and he goes, Vanessa, that's not light. That's Photoshop. Light doesn't do that. Or I was looking at a picture also of like a bride and basically it looked like the off camera flash had just hit the bride and literally in the shape of the dress. And he's like, Vanessa, light doesn't do that. Light does not come out of anything in the shape of a bride in a dress that's Photoshop. So it was super, super enlightening. And um, that's one of my favorite chapters in the book, just training you to be able to look at photos and what light does and what it doesn't do so that, you know, one, you're not playing the comparison game like I'm guilty of doing, but also so you can look at photos and then replicate it for yourself, knowing exactly what was done in the shoot and then what was done in post. I see one more question that came in, what, one that I can actually answer, which is where can I get the book? And Vanessa's book is available, you know, wherever books are sold. So Amazon, Barnes and Noble, we have it on rockynook.com and we are offering 40% off any purchase of Vanessa's book when you use code VJOY40. That code and a link to the book will be in the email you're sent tomorrow that includes a replay of this video. So you'll get a replay tomorrow. You'll get the link to um, Vanessa's posing guide and also the um, coupon code as well and the link to the book in the replay video. I think I mentioned that already. Yeah, I do see a question in the, um, in the regular chat. Uh, Dan, you says, do you use speed lights much for off-camera flash or only the bigger mono lights? So I'll use anything. Uh, that picture with the the couple in Central Park in the tunnel, that was the Canon 580 EX2 flash speed light. Um, a lot of those photos were just shot with the A1 speed light. If I need, it just happens to be like, how much power do you need? So sometimes I need to be shooting and I'm you know, outside bright sunny day and I need power. So that's when I'm gonna whip out my V10s. They're more powerful and I need it in the circumstances. But I was just shooting um, the other day with the Profoto C1, like I mentioned. It's a light that's that big. Literally, it's as big as this lens cap, a little bit thicker. Uh, and it, it's not super powerful, but I was able to use that to do that golden hour thing and to do a nice fill light on a model. Um, I think on my Instagram, I actually have it on my IGTV right now. I'll probably delete it soon because it's gonna end up on Adorama's IGTV. So if you want to see me, doing these same things, but with a super small light and in the middle of the day, by the way, uh, you can go ahead and, and look super small. And I mean, not particularly powerful, less power than a speed light. So if you can do this stuff with anything, as long as you know how to know how to do it. Great. Well, I think we're getting close to the hour mark. So probably it's time to wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much, Vanessa, for this presentation and joining us today. Yeah, this is really no helpful problem. for a lot of people. There's a lot of positive feedback in the chat as well. 
Yeah. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, again, you'll receive an email tomorrow that includes the coupon code for Vanessa's book, as well as a replay if you want to watch this again. So thanks everyone for joining us. And thank you so much, Vanessa. No problem. Thank you guys for being here. Great. Bye everyone. Have a good day.